is a Fox 45 News, your voice, your future, City Council President debate. Welcome to Your Voice, Your Future, Baltimore City Council President Debate. I'm Mackenzie Frost. All three campaigns agreed to one-minute responses to our questions, 30-second rebuttals, and one-minute closing statements. The order for the first question and closing statements were done with a card drawing. You can watch that drawing on our website at foxbaltimore.com. We also agreed to three subjects, the budget, crime and law enforcement, and education. Let me first introduce you to our candidates. We have former City Council member Shannon Sneed, incumbent City Council President Nick Mosby, and Councilman Zeke Cohen. Candidates, thank you so much for joining us. And let's get right to the first question because tonight we have a lot to discuss and I want to first go into the topics of crime and law enforcement. We had the latest consent degree hearing revealed Baltimore police is some 600 officers short. Former Councilwoman Shannon Sneed, you have the first question. What will you, if elected, do to help the city with recruitment and retention of officers, given the significant problem that we continue to hear about within the police department? Thank you, McKenzie. I'm Shannon Sneed, and yes, I'm running for city council president. I have said it before, even as a city councilwoman, that I've graduated from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. I went to Morgan State University, uh, two HBCUs right here in Baltimore City. I keep saying you cannot have the conversation of education, of crime, without having education. I've said it over and over again, even while I was a councilwoman, that we actually should be recruiting right from our HBCUs that are right here in Baltimore and right here at the University of Maryland. Maryland Eastern Shore. They both actually have uh, a criminal justice department where some of our young people are being trained to be in law enforcement, right, to be a part of the community to make a difference. I've said over and over again, we need to go out, uh, recruit some of these young college students who are looking for jobs right away when they graduate from high school, uh, graduate for college. I also have said that it, we also need to make sure um, that we are working right here with the partners that we have right in Baltimore City. Uh, uh, we have the um, some of the, our community members, um, circle of men who go out. I might have said that wrong. Who actually go out in our community that started? Oh, I'm right going to have to cut you off because Baltimore. of the time. I apologize, okay. uh, Mr. Council President. How would you help with the recruitment and retention of current officers? Look, McKenzie, public safety is the number one issue in Baltimore. It's been the number one issue in Baltimore as long as I've been alive, uh, and that serves as one thing for our police officers that this is the tough law enforcement job, the toughest law enforcement job in the entire state. Uh, and when you have jurisdictions and police departments that are all around us, uh, that are providing higher salaries, uh, that are giving more compensation, uh, that are providing better working conditions for those officers, the reality is folks come into Baltimore, uh, get the experience of a Baltimore city, and then they go and move on uh, to their next job. We have to develop a very competitive model uh, for, uh, for to, to be, in order for us to retain and keep uh, the top officers that are going to other places. It's also really important that we connect our police these force to our communities in way. Uh, you know, when I go into schools, the first thing I ask young folks, what do you want to be when you grow up? I remember as a child, it was always I wanted to be a police officer. We need to get that back into our school system. Officer friendly is critically important. Uh, we have to get back to the basics and provide a real opportunities and real resources for our officers. Councilman Cohen. Thank you, McKenzie. Look, Baltimoreans deserve to be safe and to feel safe. And while we have seen meaningful declines in violent crime, when it comes to homicides and non-fatal shootings, we still have far too many car thefts, carjackings, and other quality of life crimes in our city. And frankly, it is what drives people out of Baltimore. It is critically important that we have an all of the above approach, that we bring all of our partners to the table. That means the state's attorney, DJS, the police commissioner, just like I did after we had a violent incident in Patterson Park where a woman was badly assaulted. We need to make sure we are holding young offenders and all offenders accountable, but also making sure we are providing services to prevent crime from happening. As it relates to the police pipeline, we need to make sure our young people see a future in law enforcement, mm -hmm. whether it's in Baltimore schools, in our colleges and universities. We need to make law enforcement a career that Baltimoreans want. Councilwoman Sneed, would you, you have 30 seconds to uh, respond. 
Yes, I think I've said it over and over again that absolutely people do move into this, uh, come to Baltimore City, become police officers, uh, and move to other areas. But we still, the question is, how do we maintain and how do we get people here? It's still from, to me, I see it as recruiting men and women uh, who are from Morgan State University, who are from Coffin State University, and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, who want to be here, who we want to actually stay here for some of those students who are going to college here, who know about the community, who know about some of the issues. We want to retain them. We want to grow our population. Council President? Yeah, it's not really a rebuttal to anything that my opponents have said, but the one thing that's critically important that we're failing across the board is public safety, but then also in education. Uh, and it's like, what are we doing to identify the young folks with the skill set, with the interests uh, in connecting them uh, to the police department? But it's bigger than just the police. It's about all our succession throughout the city government. So really connecting our young folks, connecting the docs, connecting them, again, with their skill set uh, and with the opportunities and the jobs that we know will exist in the future. And definitely in a place like Baltimore, law enforcement is critically needed. Councilman Cohen? Yeah, again, I would just say that we can't just rely on the police department to solve all of our issues with public safety. They are a critical partner, but we also have to lean on our sheriff, uh, Sam Cogan. We have to look at other first responders. We need to make sure that our entire public safety apparatus, whether that's Monsi, whether that's some of the nonprofit providers, that we're all working together, and there has been far too much disconnectedness within the public safety system here in Baltimore. That is something I look forward to fixing. Well, that leads me to my next question, which is directed first at to uh, the council president Mosby. When it comes to connection, we've heard that throughout all of your answers so far is connecting resources, whether it's with other agencies or within the police department to the people on the ground who need it most. In the position of a city council president, how can you lead that position forward to ensure that those connections are being made? What more can be done that hasn't been done already? So I think the primary role uh, of the city council, and this is where I really lean on my experience of being a delegate in Annapolis and coming back to City Hall, is the legislative oversight piece. Uh, when I took over as city council president, I really pushed for this idea of professionalizing the council in a way where we were developing meaningful legislation, where we, weren't, where we were holding agencies and agency heads accountable in a way that had not been done in the past. You know, before we were doing like non uh, 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 resolutions, uh, we, we were uh, just pushing, you know, ideas, but we weren't actually creating policy and holding folks to, uh, accountable. You know, what I've been able to do as city council president and is streamline our, our council process, uh, develop uh, uh, committees like finance and performance, where we have regular legislative oversight hearings to allow citizens to come and really hear from the departments and allow uh, citizens to ask questions directly to the departments, um, particularly as we talk about breakdown in services and breakdown in connectivity uh, with our, 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 our citizenry. Uh, the one problem I've seen as exacerbated is, is obviously COVID. Coming out of COVID, that breakdown was significant, uh, and that's why we streamline the, the, the council the way we we did. I'm going to have to cut you off and, and go on over to Councilman Cohen. Yeah, look, legislative oversight is absolutely critical. And unfortunately, we have agencies that are underperforming in the city of Baltimore. To me, it is totally unacceptable that as of a few weeks ago, we still did not have weekly recycling back up and running. The fact that last summer we had four public pools that were unable to get open, including Patterson Park, uh, the second largest pool in the city and a pool in my district. I'm proud that we did what Baltimoreans do. We hustled, we organized, we connected with our business community, with friends at Patterson Park, and we built a brand new, beautiful splash pad so that the kids would have something to do over the summer. But the role of the city council president is to be both that convener, that person that is able to aggregate resources, bring neighborhoods together, but to really hold our agencies accountable. And that's what we have not seen enough of in these past couple of years. I want to make sure we are doing regular oversight, hearing, oversight hearings of all city agencies. Councilwoman Sneed. Yes, I would like to say that we also have to have um, regular oversight um, hearings. It seems like a lot of the information that comes out actually comes out from Fox 45 and other news stations. They're not coming out from the hearings. They're not coming out from the the, uh, the council meetings. And so that's disappointing because we should be hearing it firsthand in those hearings and not here on Fox 45. And so I said another part of, is to make sure, of course, ethics is very important, but we have a bill right now uh, that's been sent in one of the hearings for I don't know how long, over a year, if we want to talk about ethics and connecting the dots. Um, that bill of just aligning um, the, the ethics with what's going on at the state level, 
the bill is still, still sitting there. So we're going to talk about leadership and connecting the dots and making sure that uh, everyone has a say over what's happening in committees. Let's start there. All right, uh, Council President Mosby. Yeah, rebuttal. I'll address both. Uh, I address both. Uh, first, uh, you know, as City Council President, uh, it's my role. Uh, to facilitate the council. If a council member introduces a bill, it's their role to continue to push a bill forward. I just want to uh, uh, kind of educate. Uh, but, but back to uh, 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 council member uh, Cohen, um, we have regular oversight hearings twice a month. Um, you know, you should come to some of them, uh, just show up once in a while, where we have agencies come out and they actually provide us with real information. I think that that's the, f the financial and performance oversight committee that we've done and will continue to do. Councilman Cohen. Yeah, so Councilmember Sneed touched on ethics. I will say that I was really proud in my first term to pass the Transparency and Lobbying Act. This was legislation that made it so that lobbyists have to register publicly and let us know what they're doing when they come to City Hall. Look, at the end of the day, we want to make sure our agencies are functioning and functioning at a high level. We pay double the property taxes as Baltimore County. We do not get double the city services. And again, as council president, that is what I will change. Councilwoman Sneed, 30 seconds to respond if you wish. I don't wish to respond. Okay, let's, let's move on to question three. And I really want to dive into a little bit more of the public safety agencies within city government. The Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement plays a major role in the Mayor's crime plan and crimes initiative, uh, crime prevention initiatives. When it comes to the role of the City Council, we've had a few oversight hearings looking into some of the concerns and questions within Monzi. What more do you believe needs to be done to ensure that those agency heads are being held accountable? And do you believe that there are things that are being missed right now? Councilman Cohen? I do. So look, at the end of the day, again, Baltimoreans deserve to not only be safe, but feel safe. And the perception in our city is that it is still too unsafe when folks are walking around, particularly at night. And as a dad of two children, that is something I always worry about. It is critically important that we not only hold our safety agencies accountable, but that we're also bringing in other partners, making sure DJS has a seat at the table and that we are holding them accountable, even though they're a state agency, making sure our state's attorney, who I'm really proud to have endorsed my campaign uh, and who I work with on a regular basis, that Ivan Bates is part of the conversation. One agency alone is not going to solve it. And where I think Baltimore consistently misses the boat is it's too much dueling press conferences. It's too much uh, this agency versus that agency. It needs to be a unified approach when it comes to public safety. Nothing could be more important than the safety of the people that live here. Former Councilwoman Sneed. The, the reality is that perception is reality and people do not feel safe in Baltimore City. And so that's a problem. We hear all the time older adults who don't want to come out when it gets dark. We hear actually young people saying, I, I got to watch where I go as well. And so that is a problem. And so how do we address that? I feel like first we thank Monty for, you know, putting a plan together, but we also have to make sure that we essentially have everyone sitting at the table. I say our first role models are at home, our parents, we want to make sure that they're involved and they know what their students are doing and their children are doing. We also want to make sure that the parents actually are involved. I'm like, we, nothing can stop um, a child from, um, nothing can stop a, a student um, if they're determined to have a good education, if they're determined to do the right thing. But we have to make sure they have the resources to actually do it. Council President? So I think we can all agree, right? We're going to hear this over and over again. Crime is an issue, um, that that's the reality. Perception is reality. I got that. We can also hear that we need all hands on deck. I got that. Those platitudes are great, but we have to talk about real solutions and real policies. Um, the one thing that, you know, it's just easy about being smart on crime is if we have a young child that's already been caught up in the criminal justice system and is currently on home monitoring, we know that Monday through Friday on school days, they should be where? In school. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we don't focus on things like that and track things like that and force from a regulation perspective our state to help us do that. I'm tired of seeing young folks with ankle bracelets commit crimes or wind up as homicide victims when we should be monitoring them in a better way. When we talk about Warrant Apprehension, apprehension Task Force and developing uh, more strategic ways of intelligence in our police department, those are the things that we need to be focused on, laser focused on, to really develop policies and regula regulations that will sustainably drive down crime. We've been talking about the same platitudes of us all coming together, all hands on deck, over and over again. Let's talk about real policy. Councilman Cohen? 
Yeah, look, the other piece that needs to be solved here in this city and in this country is the mental health crisis that we see coming out of COVID. I was proud to pass the first law in the United States of America to address trauma through legislation in the Healing City Act. I will say, we need to also do more to make sure we are responding not just with police, but with clinicians, with folks who have lived experience, because the sad reality is that while we lose almost 300 people last year to homicide, we lost over 1,000 people to overdose deaths in this city. It is a crisis that we do not talk enough about. I have to cut you and, off right and there. It is extremely important. Thank 30, you. 30 seconds, uh, former Councilwoman? N no rebuttal. My colleague likes to talk about trauma-informed care all the time, and it's critically important. Uh, but when we talk about policy, it's not just about introducing policy, getting policy passed, but it's about executing on that policy. Uh, and when we look at city agencies, I believe there's only one city agency that's even started to approach down trauma-informed care. So it, that's why this campaign stuff is always interesting. It's really about looking at our records. What are the things that we've been able to do in the past, actually been able to execute and implement and see real changes on? That's what I want to focus on, particularly in this debate. Well, let's do that. I want to talk about specific plans to address some of these issues when it comes to holding agencies accountable. But at the city level, how would you go about doing that? How would you go about bringing DJS to the table and holding, let's say, Secretary Vincent Chiraldi accountable? As a city council president, what specifically would that look like? Councilwoman Sneed? We did it when I was a city councilwoman. We actually had a problem with our police department. We actually saw it when they were uh, spending in overtime, not getting the results. We brought them in on a curly basis to find out what's going on, and we went line through line to figure out how many officers were we short, how many officers that we'd need in each uh, precinct, how many... Um, Oh, goodness, excuse me. Uh, how many folks did we actually need to make sure that the beats were covered? Um, we did it, and so we would do it again. We have to call the hearings, and we have to bring the people in uh, to ask the questions, and that's just not what we're doing. Council President Mosby. I think uh, the biggest role of the city council, thanks to the voters, is the city council has the ability of not only cutting from the budget, but also redirecting spending. Uh, and I think last year was the first year it voted out 13 to 1. Uh, Councilman Cohen was the only dissenting vote. Um, but we were able to do that. Uh, one of the main uh, issues was with BOPA, right? Uh, and we said, hey, we're not going to give you your full funding. We're going to provide you opportunities to come back to us if you're able to uh, do these things in tranches. And that's exactly what we did. We also were able to bring back money out of different agencies where it wasn't effective and redirect that spending to public safety and to education. Again, the council came together, together as a unified effort. Uh, Councilman Cohen was the only person that did not. Uh, nor did he offer up any amendments to really go after and redirect spending for public space, safety or for our young folks. That's the type of leadership we need. When we talk about bringing folks together, a collective spirit, you know, there's so many different uh, uh, ideas and, and, and diversity on the council, but we were all able to come back together and for the first time in 125 years, cut and redirect spending. All right, Councilman Cohen, first answer the question, and then we'll go through rebuttals after. So you also cut half a million dollars from the housing inspectors, which is one of the reasons why I voted against that budget. Look, I'll say this. When it comes to how do we bring agencies together, it's what we've already done. When we had that violent incident in Patterson Park, myself, Senate President Ferguson, our delegation, we wrote a letter to Secretary Schiraldi and to the commissioner, Commissioner Worley, and said, it is time to stop the finger pointing. It is unacceptable to have you both going back and forth and saying this is someone else's responsibility. And then we held an oversight hearing and we brought the two parties together. We had the state's attorney in the room, we had DJS in the room, and we had BPD in the room. And we made sure every party was closing the gaps and working together. That's the kind of leadership we need. Last thing I wanna say, I am incredibly proud of the work of the Healing City Act. So many Baltimoreans, so many agencies. We won in 2023 the Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health Prize. So to denigrate that work is disappointing, but we will continue to push on, and I appreciate it. All right, Councilwoman Sneed, 30 seconds to rebut. What they keep failing to realize is that we're not bringing parents in the community to these conversations. You talked about bringing the delegates, you talked about bringing the senator, but what about the people in the community to make a difference? I feel like that's, what's keep, that's, that's what we keep missing uh, from the table, the people who have real life experience uh, that are in our communities that want to help, that we don't call on, that we don't fund uh, to help them help our communities. Council President. 
So I think it's critically important. I started out that point that it's important work. Uh, it's not about denigrating the work or the individuals that are there to use it. It's about using that work as a prop. Uh, and it's about really trying to go into the communities, like Councilwoman Sneed talked about, and really connecting and providing real services and real upward mobility and trajectories for the folks that we're trying to connect with. And that takes effort. That takes energy. That doesn't take us to just develop a policy, throw it out there, and hope that it works while we move on to the next policy. It takes real grit and it takes real work. And my experience and my background show that that's exactly what I've always done. Councilman Cohen? So again, incredibly proud, proud of that work that we've been doing, proud that we were able to in two budgets ago, secure $1.5 million for Baltimore crisis response. We know that those first responders are extremely important when it comes to solving the opioid crisis, when it comes to reducing uh, the mental health issues we see on our streets, schizophrenia, and other issues. We will continue to do that work. We will do it in coalition. The Trauma-Informed Care Task Force is meeting tonight, and I am extremely proud of every single person that continues to contribute. All right, let's move on and talk about the budget because we've had a lot of conversations about funding and we are going to get to the topic of education a little bit later. But first, we know that the mayor just presented his most recent budget, a $4 billion budget, includes a nearly $62 million budget shortfall with some plans to cover that. The first question goes to you, Council President Nick Mosby. When it comes to the utilization of the one-time federal ARPA dollars, we know that that money is being used to fund programs as well as city employees, but that money will also run out eventually. Moving forward, how would you like to see the city address some of those programs and positions if the money is not there and there's an ARPA funding cliff? Look, I've been very critical on the spending of ARPA in the city of Baltimore as president of the city council and presiding uh, folk over the uh, uh, board of estimates. I constantly vote no on every single item that has ARPA attached to it, and here's why. Uh, the fact of the matter is a once-in-a-lifetime generational opportunity for us to go after and tackle systemic issues in our city. Uh, to uh, dissipate that money uh, through social programming and social do-good uh, and, and maybe provide temporary jobs or temporary uh, uh, capacity increases for organization is one way of doing it. But another way is developing key performance indicators, looking at goals and objectives, and ensuring that we're getting our bang for our buck, a real return on investment. So we look in five years, 10 years, and 15 years and look back to ensure uh, that that was there. Uh, this is something that I fought for. This is something that I spoke up against, and I asked my colleagues on the council to do so. Uh, so I think that when we talk about Baltimore, it's really about being more strategic, particularly when we get once-in-a-lifetime opportunities like the American Rescue Plan money of $641 million. Councilman Cohen? Yeah, look, uh, I'll say this. When the pandemic happened, we saw a complete decline in so many of our city services. And I was proud to join one of my colleagues in fighting to get our sanitation workers a raise. Do you know that we were paying some of our sanitation workers as little as $13 per hour? That is shameful. And no wonder why we couldn't get those sanitation workers back to work. So we were proud to fight to get them a $6 raise, get them health care, get them to be full-time AFSCME members. That is what I would have hoped we would have used more of the ARPA dollars to do, is to really buck up and reinforce our workforce. We have a municipal workforce shortage crisis across our city and across our country. I wish that we had been more strategic in making sure ARPA dollars supported Baltimoreans doing the work for Baltimore. Councilwoman Sneed? I think it's great that we actually got the money. I don't think we need to return a single dime of anything. I think we need to make sure that we use it to put to, to good use. Um, what we realize is with the American uh, Rescue Fund is that we actually need to make sure that it's, we're actually having hearings to make sure that we're using the money. I think we should have regular hearings to even compare to see what, what came out of this? What was it used for? Did it benefit? So that way we can you look later down the line to see if actually it worked. And if it doesn't work, then we have the opportunity to actually cut it out and not even worry about it. But we first have to compare and see if it's working, if it worked, if it made a difference. Council President Mosby, would you like to use 30 seconds to respond? Definitely. Um, this is where, again, uh, our rhetoric and platitudes get in the way of real execution. Uh, so my colleague to the left, uh, spoke about the fact that uh, this money should go towards paying salaries. Well, this money runs out. 
right? So what is the sustainable long-term solution, right? That's why this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for us to really tr drive generational change. Uh, my colleague to the right talked about if it doesn't work, we'll just move in a different direction. We have one time to do it right. So that's why developing a strate strategic solution of going after systemic issues was critically important for us to do with this one-time. Councilman Cohen? So again, many cities across the United States used a big part of their ARPA, ARPA allocation to support their workforce. Uh, and when we look at Baltimore, we know we have shortages in DPW, DOT, the fire department, all across our city agencies. Again, I was proud that AFSCME, which represents city workers, endorsed our campaign. I'm going to continue to stand up and fight for workers here in Baltimore. We need to do more to have their backs when they are out there doing the work for our city. Former Councilwoman Sneed. It's amazing. Some people couldn't even pay they, their rent. Um, some people were worried about where they were going to get their next meal from. And it's unfortunate that we would say we would send money back or that we would vote no to it when, in fact, it's a need. We needed it at that time. People were out of work. They don't know when their next meal will be. And so why wouldn't we make sure that if there's a time to put this money into good use, that we actually use it to help the families and the Baltimoreans that are here? All right, thank you for that. We're going to take a quick break and we will come back with more from this Baltimore City Council president debate. Stay with us. Welcome back to Your Voice, Your Future City Council President Debate. Let's get right back into it. And I want to go back to the issues of the budget. And when it comes to uh, the pilot program, there was a new report out that indicated the 14 large nonprofits in the city paying about uh, $8 million. But the city could be pulling in $180 million when it comes to, I'm sorry, $108 million when it comes to the pilot program. The comptroller says the nonprofits are, quote, a huge burden on the general fund. Councilman Cohen, what would you like to see changed to address some of these concerns that could help the city when it comes to the bottom? line. Yeah, absolutely. So look, these institutions are great contributors to our city. We have some of the best hospitals and universities in the country. I'm proud to have gone to two of them. Uh, but the reality is that they do not pay nearly enough property taxes. And we know that comparable cities like Boston, Rhode Island, Cleveland, that have a lot of colleges and hospitals pay more. And so I do look forward in 2026 to renegotiating the pilot and making sure everyone pays their fair share. It's about how do we make 
all of Baltimore thrive. We know that we have many commitments with the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, the consent decree that we're under with our police department. We have a lot of issues in our city and we all need to be all in. And I look forward to working with our partners in the nonprofit sector to come up with a pilot that works for everybody. Councilwoman Sneed. Yes, we've tried this uh, when we were on a council uh, a number of years ago. We said we held the hearings and we thought that everyone should pay their fair share. It's still the same stance. I believe that everyone should pay their fair stance. If you're talking about education, well, we need more money for education. If you're talking about putting more money into Baltimore City, we should absolutely do it. You have the potholes in Baltimore City that we're all talking about. We have the high property taxes that we pay. Absolutely. If it's going to take the burden off of one individual group or one set like people, we should all be paying and I, they should all be paying a fair share. Council President Mosby. Um, it, this is an issue, again, that has come up and come up again, and we need leadership to bring it home. Uh, just like I brought home inclusionary housing, just like I brought home local control to our police department. It's time to bring home uh, when we talk about payment in lieu of taxes for our uh, institutions. Uh, and these are the things that we need to do. One, we need to have, from a charter perspective, a regular check-in associated with uh, uh, specific requirements of our institutions to not only talk about what they're going to do from a funding perspective, but also what they can do from an intellectual perspective. Uh, and that goes on the city behalf. I think that we do not expect enough from the institutions that are world-class institutions right here in our city to help provide and solve for some of the systemic issues that we all talk about on a regular basis. Ensure that we put them at the table in a way that we don't do enough. Uh, ensure that they come in front of the city council, not just every 10 years, not just every 15 years, but on a regular basis to report back on how does that look from local hiring? How does that look from minority women-owned business uh, and participation? How does that look for them being a fabric of our community? It's not just about the money. Councilman Cohen, 30 seconds. Well, two things. I really appreciate the report that Comptroller Henry put out, and I appreciate his endorsement of my campaign. I also want to say that we have to do more in Baltimore to retain the talent that comes through our schools. And not just the Hopkins, but the Coppins, the Morgans, the UBs, all the great colleges that we have here. What breaks my heart is seeing people come to our city or go through our high schools and then come to our colleges and then leave after four years. What we need to do is retain the talent that we grow in this city and that comes to this city. 30 seconds. It's funny, we're talking about the accomplishments of what uh, some have done, but what we fail to realize when you talk about the inclusionary housing that uh, Councilwoman Odette Rommel, that's a bill that she had been working on even before she got into council. She was going to Annapolis to work on housing. And so it's, um, it's, I don't think it's correct when we don't shout out the people who are making a difference right here in Baltimore City, who are putting in some of the, the great bills that we have uh, to help Baltimore, Baltimore out. And I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. Council President? I'm not sure why Councilman Sneed is mistaken, but let me give you the background in history. The inclusionary housing bill was my bill when I was on the council. Again, pushing real uh, legislation. Uh, at the time, we did not have a progressive council that did not believe in changing the inclusionary housing bill. So it was my number one mission as city council president to do so. So that's why I drafted a bill and provided it to Councilwoman Odette Ramos. And working with her and the team, I think I called her quarterback, my quarterback uh, at the press conference, is what we got passed in a bill that we can be all appreci uh, appreciating of and support. Uh, that is exactly the type of leadership that we need as city council president, and I've delivered over the past three years. All right, let's go on. I want to go back to ARPA really quickly because when it comes to the issues of um, the funding when for these programs that are potentially going to run out of funding after this they will. ARPA funding cliff runs out, is the city in a position to absorb some of those programs and the employees that have been hired? And if not, what role is the city council president have in this conversation to say we're no longer able to fund this? Councilwoman Sneed? I think that we actually can if we look at the budget. We heard the, we heard my, my, the council president say that, listen, um, when we were on the council, we were able to vote for a bill to actually not only take away from the budget, but actually put money to different line items. So we uh, potentially, we absolutely could do that. If there's a program that's working, we could put it out there. We could add it to the line items. So yes. I'm sorry. Um, Council President, 
I think this is the crux of the matter. We get one time opportunity in two years to spend $641 million. You need a real plan, a plan that's gonna return on investment, a plan, again, where you have key performance indicators, goals and objectives that you could look back on a regular basis in five years, 10 years, 15 years. It's the way any company, any strong organization operates. Unfortunately, that's not how we've operated this ARPA money. We've, we've put it to programs. We put it to increase capacity of organization. We put it to create uh, temporary jobs, 18 months, 24 month jobs. That is the wrong approach. And unfortunately, at the end of this rainbow, we're going to have to come to a real reality where some of this do good, some of this feel good type of social programming will have to be cut out. Uh, and, you know, the council is going to have to stand in, in, in the limelight to try to figure out what, where do we cut from and where do we redirect. Uh, that is the role of the council. That's the role that the citizens gave us. As council president, I've built an organization where we have subject matter experts to look at the budget and work through the budget with the administration. And that's exactly what we plan to do. But this is my issue from the beginning of ARPA spending. Councilman Cohen. Look, we have some real gaps when it comes to service delivery within our agencies. When I look at DPW and some of the challenges that they've had returning the weekly trash and recycling program, when I look at the Department of Transportation and challenges that we've had around just getting basic traffic calming, when I look at so many of our agencies, there are gaps, there are shortfalls. We need to do a much better job of actually making sure these agencies are well staffed, people are compensated appropriately, we are supporting our workforce, and to me, Again, that is what ARPA should have done. It should have gotten us back on track for city services. That is what the people in this city, when I talk to folks on the doors or in community, that's what they want, is for government to function and work well. And unfortunately, distributing it around to programs like Clean Core and nonprofits, uh, love our nonprofits, but it does not accomplish what we need to accomplish as a city, which is to deliver great city services. 30 seconds, Councilwoman Sneed. It's still, the, the, the bottom line is it's still, it, it still helps when we needed it the most. And, it's, and so good programs could have come out of this. Um, so we just shouldn't just throw everything to the side when reality, something good came out of it and we should use it if something did come out of it. I mean, we can put our money behind what our priorities are. And if one of these things are our priority, then we should most definitely put the money there. Council President, 30 seconds. Councilman Cohen stood silent when we jumped up and down and screamed about the spending of ARPA money. Again, every single time I get a chance to vote it on the Board of Estimates, I vote that way. If you look at the letters I've written, I've written it that way. If you look at the op-eds I've written, I've written it that way. When we look at the, le the legislative oversight hearings that we've had, we've talked about it that he has not shown up to. It's one thing to be a councilman. There's another thing to run for office. Right now, we're all running for office. All of us are good people. But it's really about the work that we've done around these issues that you're bringing up. And ARPA is a huge miss of opportunity for all of us, not just the folks that decided it, but for the citizens of Baltimore. 30 seconds, Councilman Cohen. Yeah, and again, I was proud to lead a campaign with my colleague, Councilman Schleifer, to get those sanitation workers a raise when they badly needed it. I was there, we showed up, we pushed the mayor, we pushed the city council, and we made that a reality. That is why AFSCME and all the city unions are supporting our campaign is because they know I've had their back. All right, let's to move on to the conversation surrounding education. We talked about the budget, education, public safety, it's all connected. Council President Mosby, you'll have the first question here. My colleagues over at Project Baltimore have been investigating and reporting some of the struggles within city schools for years. We've seen the reports and heard from families of the students who continue to see success in the classroom. When it comes to oversight hearings, so I know that there have been a few hearings in various committees when it comes to getting answers from city schools, but if you're re-elected, would you call for more oversight and demand answers from some of the people in the city school system who are responsible for educating the youth in the city? First, I have to use my minutes to just clarify something. The entire council was about supporting our workers. That's why we redirected money from the last budget to our workers. It's unfair for Councilman Cohen to act as if he was there. It was a Schleifer's issue. We supported it. We were all there, one by one, unified effort. Regarding education, I think there's a lot that has to happen from top to bottom, and that's accountability. Um, many people talk about the school CEO, school CEO, school CDO, but it's also about the school board, it's also about city hall, and it's also about our community. And um, when we talk about connecting the dots of all of that uh, and being accountable, look, the city of Baltimore is putting in more money in education than we've ever done so before. Right? It's time to bring local control back to the, to the city 
of our school system. Just like we did in local control of our police department, as the next city council president, I plan to do the same there. When we talk about accountability outside of North Avenue, but accountability in our community, the fact that we have first and second, third graders missing 20, 30, 40 percent of school is completely unacceptable on all of our regards. It's really about trying to uh, uh, plant the flags, understand where the red flags are, and go after them in a smart way. Our young folks need to be in school on a regular basis. Councilman Cohen, 60 seconds. So this idea that we don't have control of our school system is just wrong. Look, we contribute a substantial amount to their budget. We need to exert control through oversight. And the days of saying that Baltimore City schools are somebody else's problem, when I become president, those days are over. I know firsthand, I taught in a school that lacked heat, air conditioning, drinkable potable water, a school that had bars on the windows that look more like a jail than a school. When we send our kids to places that look like prisons, what's our expectation for them? As a city, we need to own the outcomes in our school system. That starts with universal pre-kindergarten, which is something that we must have in this city, starting with three-year-olds, and that goes all the way through high school. We need to make sure we are offboarding our young people into either college or career. Not every young person needs to go to a four-year college, but we do need to make sure they get into the building trades, a skilled trade, and they have something to look forward to so we're not graduating them into poverty. I'm going to have to cut you off there, Councilwoman Sneed. Listen, I think it, it really does take all of us. I've said it over and over again. We need more parents involved in what happens with, their, with our students. I feel like we actually have to make sure that we are having um, meetings with our teachers, not just between the hours of 3 and 5, that we need to make sure that parents can get there after 5. We also need to make sure that our school board, uh, we have an elected school board is what I would like to see, but we actually have a school board who is making sure that we are having the, the correct governance of running our school. We want to make sure that they also oversee see what the CEO is doing so we can make sure that she's on the right track. We also want to make sure that um, our, our, our parents um, who can't get there may have the opportunity to have co conversations over the phone. It's just that it, our role models start at home and it, it all starts from what our parents are able to do with the help of the village. And that's what we know they'll make a difference. We also want to make sure to, we also want to make sure that we have early childhood education. We should make sure that we actually have, I, I, I've been saying uh, education hubs where our students and our parents can actually get everything they need uh, in every part of our community because we don't have that. have to have cut that. you off right there. Uh, Council President Mosby, 30 seconds. I'm the only person on the stage that has gone to Baltimore City Public Schools. You know, uh, the conditions that we talked about, I sat there. You know, they were my teachers that had to go in their pockets to put supplies on our desks. They were my friends that got caught up in things through the school system that they shouldn't be there. It was me that had to lay my head down on the desk because we didn't have air conditioning or functioning fountains uh, in our school system. That's the type of folks you need with lived experience that has done the work, that has proven to do the work. It's not just talking about it, it's also about being about it. Um, and, and as a parent, my children are in public, Baltimore City Public Schools. Councilman Cohen? Yeah, so I think all three of us have kids in Baltimore City Public Schools. And what I will say is that my daughter is actually getting a great education at Hampstead Hill. And so this idea that all of our schools are terrible is also wrong. But we have too many islands of excellence and too many failing schools. We need to make sure all of our schools are great. There needs to be not just in the areas where folks are doing well, great public schools, but all across the city of Baltimore. That is what we have been lacking. It is too I'm gonna pocketed. Have, I'm going to have to cut you off right there. Councilman Sneed, 30 seconds. It's funny. Our council president said he's the only one who went to school here, but you're the only one who has been council president. So it goes back to what would have you done since you are the city council president? What have you done to make all of our schools better? What have you done to help uh, the kids in East Baltimore and the kids in West Baltimore? Uh, my daughter attends Commodore John Rogers. I love Don Commodore John Rogers. I volunteered at that school before my daughter was even thought of and born. Her teacher was actually teacher of the, uh, the teacher of the year for Baltimore City, and she was also the teacher of the year for the state of Maryland. All right, time's up there. Let's move on. You talked about the blueprint, obviously, is a big part of this conversation. We know that the city will be spending more money on the classrooms on top of the millions of dollars that the city already spends right now. If elected to city council president, how would you use that role to ensure that the tax taxpayer dollars that are going to the classrooms will be used responsibly and there will actually be some performance improvements from students. Councilman Cohen. Yeah, and first off, shout out to uh, Shannon's daughter's teacher, Beryl Dudney, who is awesome. 
Um, shout out to all of our teachers. It is one of the most thankless and underappreciated jobs. And I'm proud to have the support of the Baltimore Teachers Union in our campaign. Look, it is going to be critical that we hold our school system accountable for those blueprint dollars. As my colleague said, this is a huge amount that the city has had to step into. And I think it is money that we owe our next generation. So I am glad to see us filling in that gap, having taught in a place that was derelict and completely unacceptably underfunded. But it is going to be extremely important for taxpayers across our city and the state of Maryland to know that they are getting bang for their buck, that we are actually moving in the rankings, that the dollars are well spent, and that we are holding the entire school system accountable to deliver great results, not just middling results. Councilwoman Sneed? Again, the, absolutely, it takes uh, all of us, and we do want to make sure that um, our parents are well involved in what happens, and I think it, it, we need them to help um, hold uh, hold the people a a accountable as well, hold all of us accountable as well, because we can't be in every school. And so we absolutely should have hearings. We're spending about $20,000 for each of our students. That's a lot of money. And it doesn't seem like all the time across the board that we're getting what we deserve. So I would say in reference to uh, making sure that the money is spent right, we're having hearings, we're making the school board a part of the conversation, we're making sure that uh, they essentially are um, bringing parents and community, that we're advocating we're being we're bringing the community in as well so we can have these conversations and, and, and checks across the board council president Mosby 60 seconds yeah so this election is about comparison uh, and contrast and what you're gonna keep hearing from me is real policy real solutions that are executable and what you're gonna hear from our opponents is rhetoric and platitudes um, you know I haven't heard one solution what, what I'll say is again uh, taking the school system back, local control. And what does that mean, Councilman Cohen? It means that as a council, as a council member, uh, you get to confirm council board, you get to cons confirm school board members, the ones that are appointed uh, by, by the mayor. Right now, we don't do that. Uh, what does that mean as it relates to taking school system back? It means the budget, uh, them being just an agency, just like every other budget, and we can hold from their budget, we can redirect money from their budget, we can hold them accountable again on key performance indicators, uh, goals and objectives, really be a, a city agency with us. What does that mean? That means that we can, uh, uh, from a policy perspective, ensuring particularly one of the biggest issues is truancy, right? Particularly of our young folks, that we have the policies, procedures in place to go after and tackle in a way. What it means is ensuring that we have safety in our school, so unifying our Baltimore Police Department and our school police. Those are real solutions. Councilman Cohen, 30 seconds. Yeah, so just so we're clear, uh, we do have a member of the council as your education chair that serves on the selection committee for school board members. I know that. Okay. Uh, look, again, what we need to make sure we ha that happens in city schools is start young. We know zero through five children's brains do the most amount of development. We know that every dollar invested in pre-K yields four over the span of a kid's life. That is why I am going to fight with everything I have for universal pre-K for not just four-year-olds, but three-year-olds too. Councilman Sneed, 30 seconds. When I hear that they're going to actually hold up the budget again for our black and brown students who are in our Baltimore City schools, uh, somewhere where we already don't see our fair share, it, it, it saddens me. Like, I'm going to fight to make sure that we are on the right track as the next city councilwoman. I'm going to make sure that I'm sitting at the table, that I'm having the conversations, instead of saying, I'm just going to hold back on a budget and no one's going to get the money. Th th these are people that live in Baltimore City that are teaching our students, that are working for our schools. Why will we ever hold back anything instead of coming to the table to figure out what we need to do to bring them to the table to get what we need for our students? Council President, 30 seconds. Again, um... I served as a delegate in Annapolis to pass the blueprint. I understand the importance of early childhood education. Kudos to the school system. We put a lot of work and a lot of effort. We're leading the state. We're outpacing the state in uh, 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 early childhood uh, performance. Uh, it, it's critically important, again, that we talk about real policy. We talk about real solutions. Uh, when we talk about the budget, uh, it, what I said is hold the school system like another city agency. I don't have the ability to go to the CFO of the school system like I do every other city agency and department. That's why I ask folks to look at uh, the legislative oversight hearings. I'm going to have to cut you off there. When it comes to the future of the city schools, CEO Dr.
Dr. Sonia Santelises has not indicated whether she wants to um, receive a, a third contract or not. We don't know if she's interested in that. Again, my colleagues at Project Baltimore and Chris Pabs reports most of the mayoral candidates do not believe that the CEO should get a new contract. I know that this is not up to the city council president, but the opinion of the city council president carries a lot of weight in this conversation and in this community. So, Councilwoman Sneed, do you believe that the CEO should get another contract moving forward? Listen, I've said it, we have... Um, Educating our kids is one of the most important jobs. And in any business, the person that's at the top essentially uh, is charged with um, setting a direction. Um, and also, when things fail, unfortunately, they have to be held accountable. And so I'm going to say, until we make sure that every school in Baltimore City is on par, to make sure that uh, all of our kids are, are graduating, um, and not all of them have to go to college, but they have to have a, a, a place um, afterward, training afterward. So I'm going to say, if we don't feel like our schools uh, and, and our students are uh, can compete. Um, I, I think we have to hold the uh, CEO accountable. And what does that mean? So I, I believe that if she can't, you know, produce and have better results, that I don't think she should keep her position. Council President Mosby. Uh, I think that we have to look at accountability across the board. Again, we can play musical chairs with our school CEO, um, but that's us not looking in the mirror. And there's so much more outside of money that we need to do to connect the dots for our young folks in our schools. Uh, again, when we talk about, and I hate to continue to go over and over again, but first, second, third graders who aren't coming to school, unacceptable for all of us. When we talk about the level of violence that we've seen in our schools, unacceptable for all of us. When we talk about the fact that this is the first time uh, in the city's history where we have after-school organized sports, particularly for our young girls who, when they go to high school, they were at a competitive disadvantage before. Now, year-round, school-round, they have school, uh, school sports uh, because of me pushing on uh, the school system. Uh, those are just a couple of things that are critically important to whether it's the school CEO to the teacher or the janitor, a functioning school system. We all have to be held accountable, particularly the community, particularly City Hall with local control and the school system through the CEO and the board. Councilman Cohen? Yeah, look, I've had my share of battles with Dr. Santelises, but I respect her. She is tough, she is smart, and she has stayed for a long time in Baltimore, and I can't say that about all of her predecessors. But outcomes matter. And when I look at some of the outcomes in our school system around literacy, around the graduation rate, um, and just what are we graduating our young people into? Again, I think it's really important that when children in Baltimore City leave our school system, that we not graduate them into poverty, that they have a real career, a life-sustaining career ahead of them. I've been really glad at Patterson High School in my district to work closely with the Carpenters Union to try to bring that partnership so that our young people who don't want to go to college, who aren't ready for a four-year degree, can still go into a trade, can do work, and can earn a really good living. So I think at the end of the day, it's about outcomes, and the outcomes absolutely need to improve within our school system. Councilman Sneed? No, no one answered the question, though. And so it would be helpful if you go back and ask everyone yes or no. Answer the question. Council President Mosby? Yeah, I think that it's kind of getting back to uh, Councilman Cohen. Um, that again, you voted no against the Dante Barksdale Apprenticeship Fund, where we put a million dollars uh, in the hands of organizations to help fund apprenticeship opportunities for our young folks in our community. Again, it's about doing the work and backing it up. Um, you know, the school is a number one key to the thing that we all talk about, and that's sustainably driving down crime. Our young folks are suffering right now. That's why we see the violence. That's why we see the issues that are playing out on the streets every single night. It's going to take all of us. It's not just one person. So yes or no? I, I, I don't know. I, have to, I don't have an answer. Councilman Cohen? Ultimately, that is the school board's decision. I think that we need a CEO who is fully focused on this job. I'm not thrilled to see that it seems to be taking a very long time for them to come out with that decision. So I want to make sure whoever is in seat is fully focused on Baltimore. All right, we have to take a quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Your Voice, Your Future, Baltimore City Council President Debate. Let's begin with our closing statements. A reminder, each candidate has one minute. We'll have to keep everyone very tight to that. City Council President Nick Mosby, you're first. Thank you. Uh, my opponents are nice people. Uh, but this election is a little different. Uh, this is an election uh, where we need someone with the grit, uh, someone with the experience, someone with the know-how, expertise, and the connectivity to get the job done. Baltimore, we're facing some critical challenges, but this is also a critical role that we have moving forward ahead. Tough times don't last, tough people do. We need someone that's gonna show up every single day and do the job, even through adversity. And that's exactly who I've been for you. Uh, as a young person who's gone, gone to school in this public school system, seeing his mother struggle to catch two and three buses to put food on their table, see uh, my friends get caught up in situations that no child should get caught up in, I've had the lived experience. But as your delegate, I fought to ensure that houses were no longer being taken away by water bills, that the Preakness stayed in Baltimore forever, uh, that we ensure that ban the box was not just in the city hall, not just in the city of Baltimore, but throughout our state. And as your city council president, I've done the same things particularly through inclusionary housing. I've done the work. I've put the effort. I ask you to please to, support me. I'm going to have to cut you off. Uh, Councilwoman Shannon Sneed, 60 seconds. I would say if you want to know what a person will do in the future, look what they've done in the past. I've passed the most legislation, making sure that our contract workers weren't just fired, fighting for a $15 minimum wage, making sure that our top police commissioner lives in Baltimore City, making sure that the mayor's executive team lives in Baltimore City. You want to grow our population? Let's start there with our own folks, making sure that victims of police brutality had the right to speak out, making sure that not only that women who are heading back to work had lactation rooms. Those are the things that we need to make sure that we fight for, not just putting in bills, not just standing up for press conferences, but fighting for the people who live in Baltimore City, knowing that they have a fighter on their hands that will put in common sense legislation. I'm not involved in this pay to play nonsense. I'm taking public financing where a person can only give up $150 affordable for the residents who live here. I'm not backed by developers or uh, corporations or, 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 or uh, dark money. I'm supported by the people of Baltimore Baltimore City, and I have the most support of uh, grassroots support from the people right here in Baltimore City, and that's what matters. They know I'm going to have their back. Councilman Cohen. Thank you to McKenzie, to Shannon, to Nick. This has been a great debate, and look, I love this city. I believe in Baltimore, but Baltimore deserves better than its current leadership. And in terms of my legislative record, I'm proud to have passed not just the Healing City Act, but the Neighbors Against Predatory Dumping, which we know is a huge issue in our city, the Transparency and Lobbying Act. I'm proud to have just recently passed the Office of Aging with my colleague, Sharon Green Middleton. And I'm proud that in our district, in Southeast Baltimore, we grew by 5,700 people while much of the rest of the city shrunk. That is the kind of leadership, whether it's in Southeast or West, or East or North or South Baltimore that this city deserves. I look forward to bringing it and I can't wait to be your next city council president. And again, thank you for having us tonight. All right, I wanna thank all three of our candidates for participating in this debate this evening. Primary day in Maryland, Thursday, May 14th. Early voting starting May 2nd and runs through May 9th. So thank you all again for participating and thank you for everyone at home for watching. I'm Mackenzie Frost, have a great evening. I'm Kai Jackson. Thank you for watching. Here's another video to watch. Also, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel.